reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, I pray always with joy in my every prayer for all of you because of your partnership for the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. God is my witness. How I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love will increase ever more and more in knowledge and every kind of perception to discern what is of value so that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ, for the glory and praise of God. The word of the Lord. Narratives, which is 
really, really important this time of the year. They tell us something about the events surrounding the birth of our Lord, Jesus. Today's Gospel reading comes from Luke, though, chapter 3. It's like a fast forward and going, going forward. Uh, this is after the infancy narratives in Luke. We, we pick up the story with John the Baptist, uh, right before the public ministry of Jesus. Luke begins his account of his ministry of, of John the Baptist by firmly anchoring it within the political and the religious world of the first century of Palestine. Luke is telling us that both John the Baptist and Jesus lived in a very particular time and place. This is so important. We are told that it's the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Well, uh, who was that? He was a, a ruthless leader uh, who reigned from 14 AD to 39 AD. So we know that today's gospel is set around 29 AD. Rome, Rome had ruled uh, that area of Palestine for about 100 years at that point in time. But there had only been a, a, a resident Roman governor there since 6 AD. Luke tells us that Pontius Pilate was this governor over Judea at the time of John the Baptist and Jesus. Pontius Pilate, another ruthless person, right? Didn't, but he didn't occupy a very prestigious post within the empire. We know that uh, Pilate was suspended from his duties from the governorship by a senior Roman official based in Syria because of his uh, negligence and not doing a, a great job of ruling uh, over that area. He was suspended because of complaints against him, especially by the Samaritans. The Roman historian Josephus tells us that Pilate ended his own life around 39 AD because of his many failures. So, another dark little part of history right there. So Luke goes on to say that Herod is the Tetrarch of Galilee. After the death of his father, King Herod the Great, uh, King Herod the Great's kingdom was divided into four sections. So his son, one of his sons was named Herod. He was the Tetrarch of that region. Uh, which John the, and had, he had John the Baptist beheaded. So this is another very dark thing about this, this history of these people. Philip, his brother, was the governor of Eutrea, Trachonitis, outside the boundaries of Israel. Most Jews didn't regard Herod the Great and his sons as real rulers. They were self-made as a royal house, ruling through fear and oppression of the people. And another person, Licinius, was the Tetrarch of Abilene. So all of these political forces are at, are at work at this particular time. So all of them were appointed by Rome, and Luke tells us all of this, plus that this is taking place during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the religious leaders of the day. These are the, 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 the hotshot religious leaders of the day. Yet, yet, say all this, and we can say a whole lot more about the history that's there behind all of these figures. The word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, comes not to the high and the mighty, but to John the Baptist. Where? In some palace somewhere or something? No, in the desert. In the desert. So John the Baptist appears on the scene in this moment in time, in this political and religious setting, in about 29 AD. Why is Luke anchoring all this in a specific historical context? So important. Why should we be interested in all this historical background? Well, because Luke is telling us what occurred, it actually occurred, right? He's, he's not telling us a myth, a fable, a legend, no. Like, like Homer's Iliad or something like that would have been so popular at that, that time, or his Odyssey, right, or some other kind of myth, right? Christianity is a historical event, a historical religion that makes very real and truthful historical claims. God came to rescue us. He came in time. He came as a person. The saving event, Luke is telling us, is not divorced from our everyday lives, lived in our particular moments in history, including our own. My life, your life, this time, this age. During Advent, we prepare ourselves for the incarnation that God's salvation comes to us in a very particular way in Jesus of Nazareth. 
Today's gospel is steeped even in deeper history, the faith history of Israel. It's rooted in the stories of Israel's history. First, if we read the gospel carefully, we can discern that it's, it's talking to us about the Exodus events, and it's also talking to us about the Babylonian exile. These were huge events in the background of this gospel, this history. John is baptizing the Jordan, where the Israelites crossed over, ending their exodus journey from Egypt, from slavery and deliberation. So baptism, baptism, what John is doing, was symbolic of ending a kind of existence, one of wandering, homeless, right? to an existence of belonging, of being home, going from sin to grace. But also, when Luke quotes the prophet Isaiah, he's connecting back to the return of the people from the Babylonian exile, right? So Luke is saying that John the Baptist is raising the curtain, so to speak. He's raising the curtain to this rescue mission that is going to begin in Jesus the Messiah. There was a great rescue in the Exodus, in the return from exile, but now, now, God is definitively entering history in Christ the greatest rescue mission of all. So, brothers and sisters, how do I need to be rescued? I need so much, so much rescuing in my life. How do you need it in your life? May John the Baptist pray for us and prepare us to be rescued by our Lord once again this Advent season and especially come these holy seasons ahead. And now, in the presence of our Lord and each other, the best heart.
sacrifice of yours be acceptable to God, or a mighty Father. Lord, accept the sacrifice of your hands for the praise of your Since we have no merit to plead our cause, come, we pray, to our rescue with the protection of your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give thanks, Lord, Holy Father, and mighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord, for he assumed at his first coming the lowliness of human flesh, and so fulfilled the design you formed long ago, and opened for us the way to eternal salvation, that when he comes again in glory and majesty, all is at last made manifest, we who watch for that day may inherit the great promise which now we dare to hope. So, with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. mystery of faith. the bro. 
us, Lord, we pray from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin, safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power of the Lord, and the Lord Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. Graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will. Live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you all. And with your spirit. Let's offer each other the sign of peace.
Let us pray. Replenished by the food of spiritual nourishment, we humbly beseech you, O Lord, that through our partaking in this mystery, you may teach us to judge wisely the things of earth and hold firm to the things of heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The announcements before final blessing. Uh, first is a another letter from our bishop uh, in regards to the collection for the retirement fund for the uh, for religious. Says, Dear friends in Christ, Pope Francis often highlights the role older adults play in conveying faith from one generation to the next. Recently, he noted that there is no retirement age from the work of proclaiming the gospel. As we approach the annual retirement fund for religious collection, an appeal that benefits some 26,000 elderly Catholic sisters, brothers, and religious order priests, I am reminded that senior religious never retire from their vows. Instead, the prayer and ministry of older religious are an ongoing witness to the gospel. In their younger years, they laid the foundations for Catholic schools, hospitals, and works of mercy. Today, Many serve in voluntary volunteer ministry. Others are frail and need assistance. Yet all remain wholly committed to their vocations, accepting the limitations of aging and embracing the opportunity to spend more time praying for our church and world. Most senior religious work for little pay, and now the religious communities do not have enough retirement savings. Your gift to the retirement fund for religious offers support that helps religious communities provide loving care for our older members while ensuring younger ones can continue the good works of their elders. I recognize you may be experiencing your own financial difficulties. I ask only that you give what you can. Most importantly, please join me in praying for God's continued blessings on our nation's elderly sisters, brothers, and religious order priests. Sincerely yours in Christ, Bishop William Long. So thank you uh, for your uh, assistance, that collection uh, that comes up for next weekend. The angel tree uh, uh, packages are due back by December 12th. Thank you so much uh, for your participation uh, in this worthy program here for the media in our area. So that's uh, the angel tree packages again are due back by next week at uh, December the 12th. Uh, please join us for coffee and donuts uh, tomorrow, uh, Sunday, December 5th, after the 8 a.m., 10 a.m. Masses. Mark your calendars for our parish penitent service, which will be December 15th, starting at 6 o'clock. Great opportunity uh, to prepare our hearts uh, for the coming of the Lord, but purifying them for the sacrament of reconciliation. We'll have several priests, I'm sure, here uh, for everybody's service. So at 6 o'clock on December the 15th for our parish penitent service. Uh, there will be no Adoration Holy Hour this uh, month, which falls on December the 8th, coming up uh, this week. Holy day, it's a Holy Day of Obligation for the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Masses will be at 8.30, 5.30, and 7 o'clock in Spanish. Uh, lastly, uh, the Altar Society uh, will be selling wonderful goodies uh, here in the back, uh, after Mass, in the back of, of the church. So thank you for patronizing uh, those awesome ladies here and all the good work that they do at our parish. So. Please see them after Mass. And the collection baskets are at every door for your contributions. We're so grateful for it. Thank you. Have a blessed Advent evening and week, everybody. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And like God bless you and your families, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks. 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 Thanks.